Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. No problem. <clears throat> this is kind of tongue-in-cheek because uh, Ed made a funny sign out front about uh, being a Navy want or an Air Force wannabe. <clears throat> so I thought, well, yeah, you'll understand as we get going through here why and how I almost joined the Air Force. So I thought this was kind of a fun slide, and if I had known there's this much interest, I would have prepared more than just that one. So <laughs> actually, there's plenty. Um, so when I originally put this uh, information together for the sheet you see down here, Ed didn't like the picture that I chose. Um, he thought it was a kind of embarrassing, but I got far more embarrassing pictures than this one right here. <laughs> this is my uh, boot camp photo, which everybody gets. You know, we've got a little swagger with the hat uh, turned to the side. But what most people don't know about me, I actually have a little bit of Army experience as well. My first, uh, my first military experience was driving a tank. At least in my mind, I thought it was. So, I don't know how old I am in that picture, but I, I shared it with my sister, who's back there in the back, and uh, she actually became, and I hate to say this, uh, an Air Force uh, nurse uh, later in life, but uh, I think she was in charge of maintenance, because you'll notice one of the wheels is missing on my tank, so, but, uh, you know, I, I actually found that house on uh, Google Maps, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what is your helmet there? Well, I, my sister is, what is that on your head? And I said, oh, I hope it's a cooking pot, but I wasn't <laughs> sure. And then you can't see her, uh, the top of her head, but she says, why did mom hate me? Look at my hair. <laughs> so my sister is a year older than I am. So, um, and, and by the way, my name, my name came from my dad. He named me after Rudyard Kipling's book, called Kim, which, uh, and if you, if you see any Kims, they're probably born in the 50s, males, and they're probably named after that book as well. Um, you know, one of the things I've always liked about the museum was the forefathers exhibit, and I thought, you know, I don't have anything I can put in there, really. You know, I don't have enough history, but doing some of this research, and I knew some of this, um, I went back and I found some of the stuff that I know about. My great-great-great-grandfather was in the... Um, Revolutionary War, and it talks about it in the handout as well. Uh, he earned a whole six dollars and two thirds, or six and two thirds dollars a month, which really wasn't that far off what I earned when I joined the Navy. <laughs> I think I earned $110 a paycheck, so $220 a month. <clears throat> but he was engaged at the Battle of Brandywine, so I looked up that battle, and it's actually one of the the one battle in the Revolutionary War that had the most. Uh, participants, most soldiers fighting, and it was the longest battle. It lasted over 11 hours. And then he was discharged at Valley Forge. So there's some history there. And then my great-great-grandfather, George uh, Alexander Spicker, I mean, I want you to picture this stoic face here in a minute because it's going to tie into another picture. My grandmother is not the, the one pictured here. That's his second wife. My grandmother, Elizabeth, died on the on a wagon train to the gold fields in California in um, 1840, 1850, I think, around that time frame. They had one son, Charles, who was my great-grandfather. Um, but uh, George was a Union officer. He was a captain in the Civil War, <clears throat> and he loved the Union so much that he named his first son Alexander Union Spickard. That was his middle name. But it didn't stop there. We always, he had a Benjamin Franklin Spickard, and uh, their first son, after he married Mary in uh, California, he loved El Dorado, California so much that their first son was El Dorado, California Spicker. <laughs> so so the, my family has some very unusual names, just not like mine. So, um, so that's my, kind of my forefathers. And then uh, the, only, the closest one is my Uncle Donald, which I really didn't know that well. But uh, uh, that's my grandmother on the, on the his right arm there, and my dad's mom. And he was a World War II Korea and uh, Vietnam veteran. And he was an uh, aircraft mechanic. So it was my dad, but my dad didn't serve. So I don't know anything about his service. I wish I did. But um, <clears throat> George Spickard was honored by naming a town after him in Missouri. It was originally called Bigfoot Station. And then... <laughs> 
then they named it Spickardsville, and then the post office drops Ville uh, not too much along later, and now it's Spickard, Missouri. I've been there twice. I was there in 1971 for the centennial, and then I went back about eight years ago when my mom had surgery, and I decided to take a drive, and uh, it's, it's almost a dead town. There's not much there anymore. I was going to say, if you blink your eyes, you probably did see that. You would, and I wish I'd have thought to take the sign, but I didn't <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I would have, because there's not much traffic. But you know you're not really a real town until you have your name on the water tower. So, <laughs> so that is still there today. You should have taken that. Yeah. If I could have got it in my car, I probably would have. So, um, so then there's my parents. <clears throat> Uh, Ruby and Gordon, and I wanted to, I didn't, I wish I'd have known this, but I didn't really know any of this history. They never told us, but my mom wrote a diary for all the grandkids. Um, Matt, this is my son, Matthew, Thomas's younger brother. And uh, so my dad didn't serve. He had uh, uh, psoriasis or eczema or something like that, and he, he was uh, uh, rejected from service. But this is uh, my mom's service and my dad's, so in this diary, it's really interesting. It said, I remember December 7th, 1941, we were at Dale's home, my uncle. We heard on the radio that Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor and our country was at war. Many things changed then. People were leaving the, their homes to work in the city. That included me and my two cousins. We got a job in Sedalia at the Swift factory. We had a large room and a boarding house there. Our job was making powdered eggs to send overseas to the troops. After about two years, my cousins got married. They didn't say they were married to each other, but uh, <laughs> it is Missouri, by the way. So, <laughs> And I had a chance to go to Kansas City to go to sheet metal school so I could work at the bomber plant. Didn't know any about this. I was very scared, but did learn to ride the streetcars and to work. And to work. I found a sleeping room with a nice old lady who lived alone and was glad to have someone in the house with her. Um, I finished the six weeks of sheet metal. I was hired at the bomber plant as a riveter, so she became Ruby the Riveter. It was there that I met Gordon Spickard, my boss. So that's how they met. So both my parents worked at the bomber plant. So that prompted me to figure out where in the heck was that plant, because I had always assumed, my dad worked for TWA, he was an airline mechanic, that it was at the old TWA plant where the new airport is now. That's not, not the case, it was at Fairfax Airport in downtown Kansas City, Kansas. We lived in Kansas City, Kansas until I was four. And um, <clears throat> so I, when I looked it up on the map, I saw where it was. We lived about two blocks from the bomber plant. That particular bomber plant at Fax, Fairfax built uh, 6,600 B-25s during the war, and they were involved in building those. So that's my forefathers. You know, now, now go back to that picture I just showed you of my great-great-grandfather, how stoic he was. Now look at me, you know. So, why are you laughing? So, so this started my Air Force career in the Civil Air Patrol. <laughs> so, nice, nice ears. Nice ears, yeah. <laughs> My hair hasn't changed that much either, so just, just the glasses. So I, jo I joined Civil Air Patrol. I don't know how old I was there, but uh, probably 12, maybe. I don't know what the youngest age is, but uh, yeah. So, you know, we <clears throat> I joined that, and we were really proud. We wore uniforms whenever we could. There was a couple of us. But you can see I have two lonely stripes down there at the bottom. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what I did. It wasn't Boy Scouts. I tried Cub Scouts really young, but I, I did that. This was our headquarters. Um, this is where we had our, we did our training. We actually met at the Ford factory in Kansas City for our formal meetings and things like that and, and marching. And uh, I don't remember why I joined or how I joined Silver Air Patrol, but I did. Um, these two pictures here, you can see now we've been promoted, we got three stripes now. But uh, those are the two Steves, one on either side of me. And um, I think this is a pointer, yeah. So I'm in the middle. That's Steve Nixon and Steve Stone. Now Steve is the one that I think talked me into joining the Navy, but I can't be for sure about that. So we, you know, we did a lot of things. This is one of our senior members on the right. Um, <clears throat> 
We never did an actual rescue mission, but we did, the adults usually did those, but we trained to do that. I learned a lot of things. I learned how to scuba dive with ducks flying over my head. And uh, how many had those ducks in their house growing up? <clears throat> I think everybody did. But so I, you know, we, we became certified scuba divers. We never really went out and did anything because the ponds in Missouri are so murky, you can't see a foot in front of you. But I did learn how to make a bunk. Now, Lou, I don't know if that's Air Force standards, but it looks pretty good. Now, remember that picture because it comes up a little bit later. Um, this was at Chinook Air Force Base in, um, <clears throat> in Illinois. And um, that was an encampment for the North Central Wing of Civil Air Patrol. And uh, I actually uh, was the top cadet at that encampment. But one of the things we had to do was, on demand, we had to cite, uh, from memory of course, uh, General Washington's rule on profanity. Now they typed it all out and we had to memorize it and any officer that came up to us we had to stand there and recite that word for word. And believe it or not I still remember it to this day. And if you want to hear it later I'll recite it for you. <laughs> I learned how to fly. I got my pilot's license while I was in Civil Air Patrol. This picture I think this is my solo. Now, this is one of the tie-ins. This is Fairfax Airport. I had no clue that that was ever a bomber factory or that my parents were on that same ground at the time. And we had moved away. That's my flight instructor on the left, Jay Tarter. He was uh, short. Yeah. He sat on a four-inch cushion in the Cessna 150 <laughs> so he could see over the, the controls. But he was a, quite a pilot. He had, he had rented a... T-34 and took us all, did barrel rolls and all sorts of stuff. It was a lot of fun. But that was my solo. And I think about, um, it was probably the next years when I actually got my pilot's license. There's my dad up there. Um, and when I'm thinking back when I did this, this is probably the first time he was back at Fairfax since uh, after World War II. So, and I still didn't know the story. He never mentioned anything about working at the bomber plant. And so there's the, my shirt tail's been cut out. <clears throat> now, now Bill knows what that's for, why they cut those out. They say it's so you can fly closer to the seat of your pants. So I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to keep that part or this part, but I kept this part. So, so there's my, the original cutout, and then it's got the date I soloed and signed by my flight instructor. So it's amazing I still have this, but, um, but yeah, that was quite the thing. The, um, this was just kind of a ceremony at Civil Air Patrol. This was, uh, you know, a cake they made. And then this picture down here is when they, when I, after I got my license. I think I'm a second lieutenant now and uh, got my pilot's wings. I didn't fly a whole lot after that because it was expensive. When I learned to fly, it was five bucks an hour. And that included fuel because we didn't pay for the instructor. It was, he was a Civil Air Patrol member. So, this is still in high school? Or yeah. I'm a, I'm a senior at this point in high school. So, um, you know, it, that was probably about the last year right here, 72. So here's the infamous switch from my Air Force career to my Navy career. So this was from my high school senior uh, counselor. She wrote this letter to, as you can see, the Air Force recruiter. And uh, with every intention of us going to the Air Force. That's how quick this change made. And I think Steve Stone said, let's go talk to the Air Force on the way to the, or the Navy on the way to the Air Force recruiter. Well, that's what happened. We ended up signing up. And I, I had to have my dad's signature because I was still 17 at the time. So we got signed up. But, you know, honestly, uh, I, I didn't do that great in school. I was in the top 25%. My grades were okay. I didn't try that hard. That's why I thought the Air Force would be a good fit. So. <laughs> <laughs> but. That doesn't surprise me. But if, I, I do feel that if I had gone in the Air Force, I would have made Colonel because they seem to give those away too. So. <laughs> So starts my Navy career. I don't know how this got started, but everybody in my company in boot camp was from Kansas City, or Kansas City, Kansas, and we were sponsored by the Kansas City Royals Baseball Club. 
Who did that? I'm not sure. It's probably the Kansas City Royals or, and the local recruiter probably did something like that. But um, this was welcoming us to um, the team, so to speak. And uh, I actually had contacted this guy uh, less, about 10 years ago to see if they would do a reunion, but I never heard back from him. And, um, and you, a lot of you have met my wife, Sherry. And so here I am, 17. This is Sherry when I was 17. <laughs> so this is her at three years old. And I always joke, if I'd have met her when she was three, I'd be getting out of prison just about now. So. <laughs> So the Kansas City Star, Kansas City Times paper followed us all the way through boot camp. And for some reason, I was in every picture. So that's me right there. That was after we were, well, I don't know if it was after we were sworn in. But uh, if you've seen the Kansas City uh, Chiefs, Kansas City Royals uh, baseball stadium, this isn't it. This is the old Kansas City um, Athletics Stadium, downtown Kansas City. So we walked onto the field. This was a ceremonial uh, swearing in on um, July 4th of 1972. And um, didn't know any of these people, but uh, we were all in boot camp together. And then this is a picture of our first haircut. There's me, and there's Steve Stone. Now, that's not really my first haircut. That's my first haircut. Yeah. <laughs> but as you can tell, the, the faces, facial expressions are about the same. So, But, uh, you know, I don't know why I was in every picture. I didn't pay for that, and nobody did. But uh, this is uh, our first full day in boot camp, and I'm still 17. This is July 5th, I, wanna, I think. The date's cut off. July 6th, I turned 18, my second day in boot camp. And we also, you are still in civilian clothes. So that's the picture, Mike, you were talking about earlier. And here I am again, carrying the company flag. Honestly, I didn't pay for these pictures, but uh, they, they put us up in, you know, they selected um, company uh, officers and things like that. Uh, this guy right here was the shortest guy in the company, so he was the right guy. Kind of kept us all uh, marching straight. And I marched out front with the company 215 flag, and we carried that all the way through boot camp. There's a picture of me holding the flag. Uh, we've got some red stars on there for some reason. I went through puberty in boot camp, by the way. <laughs> I, I didn't shave before boot camp. I didn't have any chest hair before boot camp. But after boot camp, I started shaving. Now, for some reason, they made a shave without shaving cream and a dry razor. Oh, and God. that is horrible. Why, why, I don't know. But uh, that was protocol. And this is the group of, of leaders within the, of the boot camp. That's our, um, our chief petty officer, Chief Peachin. Uh, don't know anything about him other than and this. But it brings up an interesting story. Um, when I was 16, we went to visit my uh, aunt in Sedalia, or no, it was, uh, I can't remember the town now, uh, and I was bored. I just got my driver's license, and I went out for a drive and kind of drove through a yield sign I didn't see, and I T-boned this car and uh, totaled the car, broke my nose and everything. You know, it was pretty embarrassing. Um, so I, uh, I, I knew the guy's name that I T-boned, and uh, so after boot camp, after I got my next assignment, I went back to see my old chief, Peachin, and see who the new uh, Kansas City Royals company was. I was looking down the list, and there's that guy's name that I T-boned in that car. <laughs> I didn't introduce myself, but his name was Grant Stellwagen. I still remember that. And he doesn't drive uh, that same car anymore. <laughs> and, of course, this is graduation day. Uh, there I am, you know, looking like I'm, uh, yeah, a well-seasoned <laughs> sailor. You know, I haven't even gotten my feet wet yet. And my mom and dad, um, we had to roll our hats for some reason. You probably did that too, Lou, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have my original hat anymore, but I do have some of the stuff. Um, then after boot camp, I got orders to the Fleet Anti-Submarine Warfare School just across the street from the Naval Training Center. Anybody know what Segere Classis Destructum means? Search, classify, and destroy. That was the motto of a sonar tech. 
and that's what I became. I, I don't know if I knew that going in, but um, I was assigned to a sonar class. I was uh, in that class for nine months. I was uh, first in my class in sonar operator school and third in my class in uh, uh, maintenance school. So you weren't given an option? I don't remember if I was given an option. I know that I signed up initially for six years uh, before I even went in. And Steve Stone, who also went into the same program, didn't pass the test, and he only got four years. And he went to Okinawa and never stepped foot on a ship. So <laughs> I spent five years on a ship. And so, but uh, anti-submarine warfare school was great. I mean, you're, this is the first time I was out of boot camp and had, I lived off base and, um, you know, you could come and go. You know, I was still 18 years old or barely, uh, yeah, I was still 18 at this time. Boot camp was only seven weeks long. It was the first, I think, of maybe the first seven-week boot camp from nine weeks. And, uh, you know, it was really just there to give you uniforms about all it was, really. Uh, a little bit of damage control training. Then I got orders to the USS Hall. <clears throat> the Hall left for Westpac uh, the same time I graduated. And so they gave me the option of going on leave, which I did. And then I flew, <clears throat> unfortunately, to uh, Travis Air Force Base to catch a flight overseas. And uh, from there, we landed at Clark Air Force Base. I just can't get the Air Force out of my career for some reason. But uh, so the Air Force gave me rides, I guess, is what, what it was. Um, so I met the ship over at the fuel pier in, San, in uh, Subic Bay. Um, so the fuel pier is kind of key to this whole thing, too. You'll find out why later. But those were my orders. So I met the ship. And uh, the next day, after, after uh, meeting the ship at the fuel pier, we went to the ammo pier, loaded up five-inch ammunition, then went to Tonkin Gulf for 30 days. We were the last group of ships that actually got combat pay. Was that 30 days? And that's, that's my war story. That's it right there. So, um, But it's interesting because a lot of people, like John here, spent time on multiple ships. I only had one in five years, which I'm kind of thankful for because there's a lot of history there. The Commodore Hall was the very first. And then, um, and of course, you can see from the handout, uh, Isaac Hall was uh, captain of Old Ironsides. And that's what the ship is named after. And if you're back in the East Coast, everybody knows who he is. But here, it's not that common. Um, uh, the second hall, um, I think this was, uh, I don't know if it had a hull number or not. Did it say in there? DD-7. It was DD-7. Ugly looking ship. It looks more like one of those harbor cruise type things. Uh, but four boilers, that's you know, pretty significant. And then there's 330. Uh, 330 didn't do a whole lot. It was kind of in between wars and uh, uh, didn't really have a lot of um, history behind it. DD-350, however, uh, and this is where I, I was listening to John's story about the New Jersey and Admiral um, Halsey. Um, this ship went down in, in the Typhoon Cobra, which was Halsey's whole crew. You know, his, he was in charge of the whole thing. And, and back then, uh, you know, they didn't have weather radar and things like that. He thought they were steering away, but they steered right into it. And they had delayed refueling uh, because they didn't think they needed to worry about it. And then at the very end, uh, some of the ships were told to, to uh, ballast their ships with seawater, and they didn't get it done. Hall went dead in the water and then capsized. And then uh, there was... Um, can't think of the other two right offhand. I think it's in the handout. But uh, three destroyers were sunk in that typhoon. And that would be a great uh, topic of, for coffee and conversation. There's no, I don't think there's any living survivors yet. Interesting thing about this, I worked at Home Depot down in Santa Fe years ago, part time. And one of the guys I worked with, he said, yeah, my dad was on the hall. And I said, oh, really? When, when did he serve? And then he said he was on the DD-350. He was one of the survivors. So it's been great to hear his story. And then this is the ship that I went on initially, um, USS Hall. That's how it looked. We had, uh, this is, as I told John earlier, this is the last of the all-gun destroyers, the Sher four Sherman class. We had three five-inch guns right here, five-inch 54s. Uh, there's uh, a three-inch gun here you can't see. We also had hedgehogs right here and depth charge rack on the back. I'll tell you. 
Don't think I'm going to leave that part out. <laughs> so um, now, I, the, as far as the depth charges go, I don't remember exactly if they were on board when I uh, joined the ship. The depth charge rack was. In 1972, Westpac, uh, the captain, since they were going on the gun line, uh, had the depth charges themselves removed because they didn't want a stray bullet blowing up the ship on the depth charge. So, um, <clears throat> but I don't remember if they were ever there, um, in, actually in the racks when I joined the ship. Uh, this is the hull uh, after 1974 when we came out of the shipyards. There's no more hedgehogs, they're gone. The, of course, the depth charge racks are gone, and we have now an 8-inch 55, which, uh, which talks about in the, um, in the handout a little bit. And um, so that was the new configuration. We were part of the Little Beavers, Deseron 23. I think we joined a couple different ones, but that was, what, uh, that was the squadron I was on when we first joined. So Westpac 73, this is uh, after I flew over to Subic Bay. My first job was to hold up that gun barrel. I, I don't know why they asked me to do that, but I was happy about it, whatever it was. So, but this is the hedgehog deck. This was my first duty assignment, basically. said, so you're responsible for anything that happens on that hedgehog deck. And this is forward of the bridge on the, on the 01 level of the ship, so one level above waterline. These are all dummies. Not this guy, but these are right here. Uh, they're... What they were were, the hedgehog is kind of like a depth charge, except they had to hit the submarine. They couldn't, they didn't explode due to pressure. They actually had to strike something, and they were, you know, kind of not rocket propelled, but charge propelled off of that stand. We never did fire actual hedgehogs. Uh, we did fire some dummies with die markers in them so we could, you know, test the, the electrical of the mount. Uh, the hedgehogs that we had in the magazine were all, um, loaded in that magazine in 1942. Well, they're 1942 weapons um, that were put on our ship in 1954 or 55 when it was commissioned. You think a hedgehog is, uh, can cause damage? This is the USS Solar. If you want to you know, re do some research on that, they were loading hedgehogs and a crew member dropped one down the hatch into the magazine. That's actually the bow of the ship right there. It folded the bow of the ship backwards, and those are the kind of things we carried on that ship. I don't know how many we had, but we were real careful when we took them out. Um, so you can imagine what it would do to submarine. Of course, that's a whole magazine going off. Um, one of our other assignments was, this is called a fanfare. It's a noisemaker. We'd stream that behind the ship to make more noise than the propellers did. So if we had a torpedo fired at us, hopefully it would, it would home in on that sound instead of us. And this is Subic Bay somewhere, I'm not sure exactly where in Subic Bay. And this is my Air Force uh, bunk skills right here. Uh, see, I seem to have lost those. So that was my first bunk on the ship. Uh, it was a top bunk, about shoulder width, and uh, right next to steam pipes. So it wasn't the most comfortable, but uh, you don't want a lower bunk because when the guys come back from the beach, you know, and they can't see straight, they're stepping all over you on the bottom. So the top was fine for me. Did you have a foot locker for personal items? Uh, we had a regular up locker that stood up, but later we got a modular bunk, and I talk about that a little bit. This is the night our compartment flooded. It wasn't because we were hit by a torpedo or anything exciting. They were sounding the tanks. So they, they have a crew member that comes in, drops a copper... Um, I don't know what you call it, like, like a measuring stick that unfolds like an old carpenter's rule. Drop it down, they measure the water in the tanks and it shows on the strip and then they take it back out. Well, they forgot to put the cap on the, on the sounding tube and they started transferring water with pumps. And this probably put about six inches of water in our birthing apartment, but that was the cleanest it ever was, actually. <laughs> That's uh, Rabbit right there. You can figure out where his name came from. Um, so uh, we, were, we had to clean it up, and this is the chief's quarters that were right next to ours. We also flew a McDonald's flag, so every, uh, every Sunday we had a barbecue out on the, uh, the fantail, and we'd raise the McDonald's flag, and they would cook hamburgers and hot dogs and things like that out at sea, and we didn't do it in port. Um, so that was kind of fun times. Uh, here I am standing watch, barely. Um, that's the sonar control system. 
We, a lot of people were jealous of us because we had to wear foul weather gear in sonar because it was so cold. And it's so hot in, you know, out at sea in the, in the Philippine Sea or the Indian Ocean, we had to put on foul weather gear. And this is part of the, part of the crew. Uh, these guys have been around forever. Shorty here made chief. He thought he was God's gift to everybody. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know where all these guys ended up, but they had been on the ship uh, when I uh, came on board. That's our fire control system right here. Uh, he was in charge of fire controls, all servo motors and dials and things like that, and that's how we uh, uh, shot torpedoes. Uh, we, we saw a lot. I, you know, I have more pictures of Westpac 73 than any others. This is on the island of Guam, and this is a memorial to the last battle the Japanese fought on, on the island of Guam uh, there, and I don't know what the inscription said. Uh, this one here is on Midway, and you can see the Goonie bird back here. Uh, when we were there in 73, it was nesting, nesting season, so you can't uh, touch a Goonie bird. It's a protected bird, and they had a little three-hole golf course there, just a little chip and putt thing, and if they were on the green, you just put it around them. So, uh, but this, this cross is the last place that there's an Easter sunrise service before you cross the date line, and it starts all over again. So it's kind of an interesting memorial right there. Um, and here's, you know, this is what the Goonie Birds looked like when we were there. They were all over. Uh, this is our torpedo man, and they had a memorial to the Goonie Birds, but you can see them all back here. This is a recent picture after Midway was um, decommissioned as a Navy facility. It's now a National Wildlife Preserve, and this is nesting season in Midway now. Um, it's the only island around for, for a long way, so that's probably why the birds are landing there. Um, so in 1988 is when it became a National Wildlife Refuge. Hong Kong was my favorite port to go to. Um, this is an iconic vessel that was always around the harbor. Um, and uh, I think this is Wan Chai right here. I'm standing on the stairs right there. Um, we anchored out in the harbor. We weren't allowed to anchor at Fenwick Pier. It was a British uh, territory at the time. And uh, so we had to take a boat back and forth. Interesting thing, one night we had a guy walk up the ladder from the water soaking wet. He had swum from Fenwick Pier all the way out to the ship because there were no more boats coming. <laughs> you want to be AWOL, huh? Yeah, he didn't want to be AWOL, but that had to be quite a swim. Um, so here I am again, uh, just posing for pictures. You like the red pants? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I still had some of those, but. <laughs> One of the things on, on, the, um, on this particular cruise, and it may have happened before I was on board, but um, we were tied outboard uh, another ship in port in Subic Bay, and, and uh, they had wired the gun mount backwards. And so when they sent the signal to rotate the gun, it went the opposite direction. Well, when they did that, it hit a deck locker that was bolted to the deck, and it uh, pummeled that locker over onto the deck of the next ship. And uh, it didn't do any damage, except the locker was, wasn't repairable. Uh, probably most memorable on this uh, cruise was um, the Tug Marpole, and I think we talk about it in the, um, in the handout a little bit. The, the Marpole was an ocean-going tug that had left Pearl Harbor, to go somewhere. I'm not sure where they were headed. But we were five days out, five days before Christmas, on our way from Pearl Harbor back to San Diego. We all had flights to go home for Christmas and everything else. Uh, there was a distress call from the MARPOL, from, the, from uh, the radio operator. And they turned us back toward Pearl Harbor. And so we immediately uh, airlifted an officer off the ship, sent him to Pearl to fly back and make res new reservations for everybody. Uh, fortunately, American Airlines was on strike and had just come off strike right before we got back, so there were plenty of seats. But this P-3 Orion up here spotted the survivors, and we were the closest ship, so we were sent, I think within a couple of hours, we were alongside. Uh, this is the first picture I took where they are um, uh, first spotted. There were three survivors out of seven, I think, and um, this is the same picture, a little bit closer. They were too weak to um, paddle or do anything else. 
And uh, they sent a uh, warrant officer, thought he would be a hero, and he put on swim fins and he jumped in the water and, and was going to swim a line out to him. And then some, I don't know if this is really what happened or not, but the uh, forward watch with a, with a rifle said he spotted a shark. Well, you can imagine this warrant officer trying to climb a cargo net with swim fins on. It was pretty hilarious. <laughs> but he didn't make it out there, so we did a shot line. We just shot a line over the top of them. They were able to grab that, and we pulled them in with a smaller line than we would have normally used. Uh, this is bringing them back to San Diego. Uh, the lady in the middle, um, Marge, was an auxiliary Coast Guard Commodore. And... Um, he was a, a previous destroyer sailor, and this is the captain of the tug right here. Uh, we went alongside uh, an oiler to refuel, and uh, the captain thought it would be fun to put Marge in uh, an officer's uniform and get on the radio and talk to the other ship. And uh, so she did, and uh, you know they, they didn't think they heard a woman's voice at first, and, they, and the captain said, yeah, we have several women on board. It's a new test in the Navy. Uh, with women on ships, and uh, it, was it was pretty funny, but we brought him back, and I don't know what happened to him, but uh, that's really uh, the highlight of that particular cruise was being able to rescue those survivors. Do you know what, what caused the tug to sink? From what I remember, uh, the ship had an asphalt deck on it, and uh, they got into some rough seas, and the asphalt started peeling away. And uh, it went down in a matter of minutes, really. They managed to get a distress call out. There was no lifeboat. The lifeboat went down with the tug, and it was tied to the tug. And, but it went down so far that it uh, had air baffles in it, and it popped back to the surface. And it took them, took them quite a long time to get it flipped over. But there were no food on board. Everything had spilled out. And uh, so they, you know, they were out there three or four days. And uh, they never, they saw ships at night, but nobody ever came close enough. <clears throat> this is an interesting crane. This is in Long Beach. Now we're in Long Beach. After our uh, Westpac 73, we were transferred to Long Beach for, Long Beach for retrofit. So uh, the hedgehog mounts came off, thank goodness. The uh, depth charge rack was gone. The front 5-inch 54 was taken off. And uh, an 8-inch 55 was put on board as a test platform. But this is Herman the German. This, this was seized after World War II. There were three or four of these cranes. Uh, and it's a, it's a self-propelled crane on a barge. Has a crew that runs it. And this was used in Long Beach. It is now in uh, Panama Canal. They sold it to them. There were, uh, <clears throat> I think there's only two known to exist. But this was used by the Germans to raise U-boats out of the water so they could service them. Huge crane. I mean, it dwarfed anything uh, around. It was pretty amazing. So we started getting the 8-inch gun. I didn't take very good pictures back then. But uh, the gun was put on. This was without the mount. It doesn't look very big, really, at this stage. But that barrel was, uh, it's an 8-inch 55, so it's 440 inches long. And so it's like 33 feet of barrel. Uh, and, of course, part of it is inside here. And it dwarfs the, the front of the ship. Um, the captain wanted to save all of the um, shell case, not the shell casings, but the powder casings, because they were brass, solid brass, and they were about this tall. Uh, the, the bullets themselves weighed 264 pounds apiece, 260 pounds apiece. And so they were loaded onto the ship with a special wheelbarrow to a chute, and they were loaded in the magazine. We only carried 75 rounds for that gun. But the captain built this chute right here, so when it fired, it would eject. Uh, the casing onto the deck so he could turn them into ashtrays for uh, visiting dignitaries. <laughs> the crew never got any of them, but you can see there's a lot of people up here. And, um, Were there any crew inside the turret there? Was it all, uh, all unmanned. Yep, it was all done from a control center. Um, I mean, it was a, it was, it looked good, but the gun was really uh, inaccurate. Uh, we, we test fired quite a few rounds. We took it on Westpac uh, 76 with us, but during the test firing, uh, we had uh, loaded 10 laser guided projectiles. And you got to remember, this is 1975. Um, uh, we were off, uh, we were at the Naval Gun Range off San Clemente someplace, and uh, they had some shore targets set up and illuminated by a laser on a helicopter. 
and we didn't hit any of them with the laser guided projectiles. Uh, they towed an old um, destroyer out to sea and we were going to sink it with the eight inch gun, we thought. And um, we fired, I don't know how many rounds of, the, of that eight inch and we, one round hit it at the water line. And uh, they said, well, we're not towing it back, so you better sink it. So they turned the two, other two five-inch 54s on it, and about 10 rounds later, it was under the water. So, it, you know, the gun, I think I mentioned, it's, it's now a lawn ornament at the Naval Weapons Center in Dahlgren, uh, Virginia. I think it's where it is. I, I actually contacted their museum to see if I could find a picture of it. Uh, they, allowed, they had us uh, create a special stamp. And we mailed them to ourselves. I mailed one to myself, mailed one to my dad. I've got both envelopes now. But it commemorates the first test firing of the Mark 71 gun. And it was uh, 16 April 1975. Now, I picked this up from John's presentation. But in 1975, I had my annual sonar hearing test. And it was normal in 1975, after a year in the shipyards. They didn't give us hearing protection. 1976, I had my annual sonar hearing exam, and I had high frequency loss in both ears from that gun because our control room for sonar was, our equipment room was below the mount, and that's where we were a lot of the time. So I started losing my hearing when I was 20 years old. Fortunately, it's only gotten moderate at this point, but uh, that's looking down the barrel of the gun. I mean, it was an impressive sight. We'd go out to sea with this thing, and people would um, comment, you know, what is that, you know? And, um, it was an amazing weapon. These are some pictures from the 76 crews and uh, some of the shipyard um, uh, workers that were installing the weapon. Uh, out to sea, we got sub pay half the time because we were under the water up there. So, uh, you know, we had to wash down the ship all the time when we come back into port because of the salt water. It would just crust everything. Um, that's, there, are, there we are washing it down before we get into port. Um, I don't know how they saw uh, from the bridge over the top of that thing. It was so big. Uh, what do you do when you're not on Westpac? Well, it's out on Monday and on Friday. You don't get to stay in port. You, know, you think once you've been back from Westpac, you get to stay in port and live a normal life. Well, that's not true. Uh, you go out on Monday, you come in on Friday, you operate. Um, you know, we did a lot. Um, what I did when we were in port was usually shore patrol. I would get assigned shore patrol, and, um, which was fine. It got you out of doing normal stuff. So I was assigned for a 30-day temporary assignment uh, on shore patrol, and I was assigned to a parking lot off base. So I said, eh, that's okay. So I get out there, and there's a tower out in this parking lot, and there's a big spotlight that shines down on the parking lot. Little did I know that was the most fun I ever had on shore patrol. <laughs> Because I, the guy I was relieving said, hey, you're never going to believe this, but every night a cab comes into the parking lot, stops right below the tower, drops the guy off, he strips down, changes clothes, gets in his car and drives off. You know, I thought, oh, yeah, sure, you're, well, my first night alone, here he comes. And every night for 30 nights he did the same thing, not knowing there was somebody in that tower <laughs> above him. <clears throat> but that's not all that happened. One night I got a radio call from, uh, I guess, uh, the base police saying that there are uh, two recruits from Marine Corps boot camp that had kind of left boot camp. And uh, they had been seen walking down the railroad tracks. Well, the railroad tracks are on public property. The parking lot I was in was on base property. And then, of course, the base was on the other side of the highway. So I watched for them, and here, sure enough, here they came walking down the railroad tracks. So I call in base police. And they pull into the parking lot, which is base property, and he hollers at those guys to come over. I, I want to talk to you. Well, once they stepped on the parking lot, he arrested them, took them back to boot camp. Uh, then another night, there was a fight out on the highway right below the tower. And uh, so I reported it while I was in the tower. Then I followed the car with binoculars to see where it was going. Well, it turned into the base. And uh, so I got a letter of appreciation from the base commander for the apprehension of the guy. Uh, that was, and they mentioned the guy that was beat up, the victim, uh, Seaman Dale Bearsheim. So a lot of things happened on that shore patrol. It was actually kind of, kind of fun. What rank were you then? I was probably still an, e, I was still an E4. Yeah, I was still a third class petty officer. Westpac 76. <clears throat> so this is our route. Um, we left San Diego, 
went to, went to Pearl Harbor, which we always do. We refueled at least once between San Diego and Pearl Harbor. How long did it take you to get to Pearl? Seven days, yeah. At uh, 26, 27 knots, you know, it takes a while to get there. No, we were traveling by ourselves at that point. We, there may have been another ship in, with us, but um, <clears throat> on this particular cruise, we had one fatality. We had a little, uh, new little kid came on board, you know, probably 18 years old, and uh, got married right before he left port and uh, jumped overboard uh, halfway between Pearl Harbor and, and uh, San Diego. And um, we never found him. We, uh, we, we did a maneuver in the Navy they call a Williamson turn, where the ship can make certain timed uh, rudder changes and come right back down the same path they were at. We did that, and uh, we, never, we never found him. Uh, we, we heard uh, a week later that a, a cargo vessel had spotted a body, and they, they think it was his. But he committed suicide, we think, for the insurance money or something. It was all speculation at that point. Um, so we got to Hawaii. The next day, we... Uh, went to Kauai uh, for, I think, so people on Kauai could come and visit the ship and things like that. Well, I was, assi I was assigned shore patrol again. So, and there's no base there really, per se. So I was out with the uh, local police, just riding around with them, and I got a call to come back to the ship and uh, found out my father had passed away. Uh, died of his third heart attack. He was 62 and uh, but that one took him really quick. So I had to, uh, the next day, the captain took me uh, to the airport in Kauai, flew, flew back to Pearl Harbor, caught a, uh, I want to say, a, an, and it was an Air Force plane. Now I'm going to make fun of the Air Force here in a second. But. <laughs> you know, we'd have, we'd have pushed you out. <laughs> so I got on this plane. It wasn't a cargo, it was probably a cargo type plane, but they had regular seats in it, and it was loud. It was loud. How many remember the time when you're, you're on an airline flight back in the 60s, 70s, and they passed out chewing gum to, when you took off so you could pop your ears? Well, we get on this plane, and I, I think it was a Navy officer in the front row of these seats, but the, the crewman was passing out these little things about this long, and, and I'm watching. I had never really seen them before. I knew what they were for, but I didn't see them. And uh, the, the officer who was in the front row picked one out of the can, looked at it, popped it in his mouth, started chewing it. Well, they were wax earplugs. <laughs> and you're supposed to tear them in half and put one in each ear is what you're supposed to do. So I didn't follow his example. but uh, So I flew back, to, uh, flew back to Kansas City and uh, attended my dad's funeral, uh, grabbed a few mementos while I was back there, and one was his fishing pole. Now, Matthew's probably heard this story before, but... Um, I wanted that. I wanted his fishing pole, and I still had it. And I should have taken and then taken the line off and reeled it up, but I didn't. I put a weight on the end of it, a little small weight, no hook, wouldn't do any damage. So I put it underneath my seat and uh, flew into San Diego. Now, San Diego Airport, you walk down the the uh, onto the tarmac when you exit the plane. So I carry this fishing pole out. I'm off the plane. I'm carrying it down the ladder into the into the airport and I notice all these people laughing. And I, and I look back and all these people are doing this. I had released the fishing line in the back of the airplane. And I strung fishing line all the way through into the airport and I actually broke it with my hands and I cut my fingers just from this, the line. But I, I kind of walked away like I didn't know what happened. But. So we get back, uh, you know, the leave is over, and we get, I get back to San Diego and have to go back up to Travis Air Force Base to catch a flight back. Well, before that, they said, where's your medical records? Where's your immunization record? And I said, well, they didn't send them with me. So three weeks prior, we had 13 different shots we had to get. They didn't send my immunization record. So three weeks later, I got 13 more shots. So... I'm, I'm probably immune from just about anything. I don't know, really know. So, you know, Westpac, uh, pretty uneventful, really. We did, uh, we did fire some torpedoes. Uh, these are exercise shots. Well, once they run out, they float, and we pick them back up. Um, some, of the, some of the crew members in the ship, this is Joe Stomberg. He was a first-class petty officer, been in the Navy for at least 200 years, I think, um, and some of the other crew. This gentleman right here, 
uh, Auburn was uh, ex-Army. He came in and joined the Navy after getting out of the Army. And he was actually in uh, Korea when they exchanged the Pueblo prisoners. He was on one side with a, with a rifle pointed to somebody on the other side. And he says there's probably they were doing the same thing to them. So he joined, he joined the Navy. Nice guy. Everybody was a, a good crew. Um, this is a, uh, a video. Whoops. I don't know if that's going to play or not. Uh, take me back to the other slide. I won't play it because we're probably kind of long on time, but um, just hit, hit the from beginning, or not from beginning, but from current slide. This, I, when I, I saw this video, I took the video, and uh, go ahead and hit uh, right up there from, from current slide up top, all the way to the top. Keep going. No? Where it says current slide. Yeah, go down to 61 down there. And then go at the very top, right up here where it says from current slide. See the pointer? Keep going all the way. Oh, okay. Now hit, you know, go ahead and hit that up here at the very top. Bring your mouse up. No, bring your mouse all the way to the top of the page. See the pointer up here? Yeah. Okay. So... <clears throat> Yeah, probably. <laughs> wow. So if you bring the if you bring your mouse down toward the bottom of that black strip at the bottom, it'll probably pet play. There should be a play button. <clears throat> I don't know how to do it from here. Okay. This uh, this I thought was a change of command ceremony, but it tend that ended up being, this is Memorial Day in Guam in 1976. And uh, I had a little Super 8 sound movie camera. The sound didn't come through very well on here, but uh, this is what, this is the kind of crowds that Guam draws. I mean, they don't do a lot there. You know, Lou, you've been to Guam, right? Yeah. Um, we were sent there for 30 days. I don't think we were being punished, but um, <laughs> we wanted to give the shipyard workers something to do. So uh, they sent us there, and we, uh, somebody sunk the captain's boat one night. Uh, it was tied, tied behind the ship, and they pulled the plug on it. And uh, the next morning, you see this rope going down, and that's all there was. So they, they had to pump that out. Captain wasn't too happy. Um, in 71 was the last Japanese soldier was found on Guam, still hiding out after World War II. His brother had to come and coax him out. So they're playing patriotic music, you know, that's what they're doing right now, but I'm going to go on to the next slide. If you want to play that one, I don't know which carrier this is. Enterprise. Is it the Enterprise? I just didn't remember. Um, there was uh, some refugees from Vietnam had set their boat on fire so they could attract attention to the ship, and uh, I don't know who picked them up, but they were on the carrier at the time, and they asked us to take them back to Subic Bay. So these are just some videos of me uh, on the destroyer taking pictures. So we sent a small whaling boat over to pick them up. And that's not a pleasant ride, um, especially in between. Well, both ships were stopped, so that helped a little bit. But here they are bringing them back to the ship now. How many were there? Five or six, I think. Yeah, you'll see them here in a minute. Um, interesting story about the... The carriers, when they have a man overboard, they usually send a helicopter to pick him up. It's, you know, that's their standard practice. We were off San Diego Harbor, and they decided to do a man overboard drill with their boat, just like we did with our whale boat. And um, so they throw a dummy in the water, and uh, the helicopter actually dropped a dummy off. Here comes the boat, and it's going across the water like this, and it gets lower and lower and lower. And all of a sudden, all, five, all the guys in the whale boat are in the water. They didn't put the plug in the back of the boat. So, so then all of a sudden, you see, here comes the helicopter coming and picking those guys up. And we went and got the dummy and towed their boat back for them. This was a common occurrence. If you ever see uh, re fuel replenishment, um, 
we, we were out with the Kansas City a number of times. I don't know if this is the Kansas City, but it was an oiler, and their motto on their ship, we're number one and number two and something like that. So, <laughs> But uh, number two fuel. Um, but we would, my, my station was a midship, so it's right in here somewhere, and we would haul stores back and forth. So uh, they, they do a shot line, and then you start bringing over bigger lines until you get to a cable, and then you start bringing over the oil lines, and that's how we refueled at sea. And we did that a lot. Um, here we are. Uh, we went to um, Taklaban City, which is uh, Lede Island, where um, MacArthur returned to. And we were there, I don't think I have a picture of that, but we were there in, uh, on an anniversary of that event. And uh, we were anchored out in the harbor. <clears throat> and um, we got back from uh, being on shore. And Joe, uh, <clears throat> when I got back to the ship, Joe was standing there in his underwear. And he shook my hand and didn't say a word and turned around and went back to bed. And that was the night that I made E6. They got the word. Uh, that I made first class petty officer, and it was pretty unceremonious. But, uh, you know, usually you don't get congratulated in underwear. But uh, so I made E6, which uh, I did that in four and a half years. Not quite colonel, but it was pr pretty good. Um, and uh, here we are. I wasn't sure if that was me or not, but it was because this is the guy I thought it was back there. But there's my 1970s mustache, and we're on, on duty. Uh, here we are somewhere. I don't know where it was, but uh, probably coming into port since I'm in whites. It never failed. Whenever I had shore duty <clears throat> overseas, they served spaghetti. And, <laughs> and you had to eat dinner before you went on shore duty. So I, I learned not to wear my, my uh, top shirt, just my T-shirt, until after we had spaghetti. Um, Westpac 78. Okay. Uh, right before Westpac 78, I went to leadership and management school on Coronado. That was the closest I've ever been to the SEALs. Those guys don't walk anywhere. On that base, they run everywhere, and they run in place at a stop sign until the cars are gone, and then they keep going. But th it was a great school. We learned, uh, I got like uh, 15 college credits just from that class. It was a two-week class, uh, and that was a lot of fun. You can see the uniform change. Now we're wearing black with uh, that hat. Uh, Chiefs are still in the khakis. Now everybody wears khakis. I, I, you know, it's really, it's really different. So Westpac 78, I had 89 days in the Navy left. And the rule was, if you got less than 90 days, you don't have to go on Westpac. Well, I was the only E6 in the department. And they said, well, you got you to go with us. And so uh, we went overseas. And we got to Subic Bay, and they said, um, we're, gonna get, we're going up to Manila, so we ship went up to Manila, and uh, <clears throat> I got assigned shore duty, or not shore duty, but shore patrol again, in the police station in downtown Manila. Now, this is during martial law, so uh, you can't be on the streets after, after midnight in the Philippines. Uh, Marcos had um, instituted martial law and didn't allow it, so... Here I am in the back of the police station, just in case they drug a sailor in. Ship didn't pick me up. And so it's after midnight, and ship can't come and get me. So they were going to have me sleep in the back of the police station. And I was kind of a, 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 an anomaly because I was in whites, and uh, I was in the back of a police station. So they don't know if I was arrested or not. But anyway, the provost marshal got, took sympathy on me and took me back to the ship after midnight. Otherwise, I would have slept on the ship that night. Fate of the USS Hall. Um, it was sunk as a target. Uh, the veteran of 20 combat patrols made her final sacrifice on April 7, 1988, not in the breakers yard, but in the Eastern Pacific Ocean, as a test bed in the development of new weapons employment <coughs> tactics. So in, um, the, the eight inch gun came off in 1988, I think. It did one more Westpac. Then they pulled it off and then restored the ship to a five-inch configuration all around. Um, nobody really knew what happened to the hull. Um, a gentleman um, was up in San Francisco, and he found the hull between, let's see, this is between the uh, John Paul Jones right here. Whoops. John Paul Jones uh, here and the USS Oklahoma. So it had already been stricken. Uh, from the rolls in um, 
when it was decommissioned. And then later it was stricken from the roll, so it was no longer even a decommissioned ship. There's nothing on it. Uh, you can see that John Paul Jones still has a 5-inch gun on it. We had, there was nothing on the hull at all. So um, Leon Him, who was an, a signalman, signalman two, was the last real crew member to walk that ship. He, got, he talked the Park Service and letting him on board. So he put the ship in temporary recommissioning. That's a commissioning pennant right there. He, fl he flew that uh, flag on it. The next day, they towed it out to sea. So he was the last one to uh, see, the, see the ship and be on board. That's what it looked like after it was hit by a Hellfire missile from a helicopter. Um, the missile hit the bridge, totally wiped it out. Uh, officers' quarters had been up here where they were. Now, there's a, there's a movie on YouTube of the hall that shows a lot of the 1976 uh, Westpac pictures. And it shows the ship being struck by a torpedo. It's not the hull, it's the Maddox. And, and you can tell, first of all, it was, this was shot by a missile, and the Maddox still had the guns on it. So it wasn't our ship, but somebody thought it was and put it in the YouTube video. It's kind of a rust bucket. Um, so, you know, it wasn't, uh, I don't know what finally sunk it, but it may have just sat there until it sunk. So him um, contacted the Navy and find out where it was. There it is right there off the coast of uh, the U.S. in uh, 2,096 fathoms, so it's about 12,000 feet of water. I doubt that anybody's going to go visit it anytime soon. So last day in the Navy, I still look the same. <laughs> go back to that first picture. <laughs> the glasses are different. I've got a mustache, so puberty kicked in finally. Uh, Post-Navy, I went to work at IBM right out of the Navy, as Lou did. Uh, I, yeah, I challenge you to find me in that picture, but I'll give you a hint. It's right there with my afro. We all look like convicts, but uh, I worked on the copier line. I was a technician. Um, when I uh, got out of the Navy, Sherry was 13, so I made some progress. No, no, she wasn't quite. When I, uh, let's see, when was it? She was, oh, I'd go back. Um, so this is at IBM, uh, my wife Sherry and Thomas, Matthew's older brother, and this is uh, Danny Dietz Sr. Uh, Danny Dietz was one of the SEALs that was killed in Operation Red Wing. Uh, they made the movie Lone Survivor about. Danny was uh, a local Colorado resident, and we had his father come to Excel on Veterans Day and uh, talk about his son's service and also the foundation that uh, he started in his son's name, the Danny Dietz Foundation, and they're really active in keeping kids out of trouble. There's a, uh, there's a highway name yeah, right down in Santa Fe. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things being working at Excel, I was part of the veterans group there. I was uh, invited to attend the Medal of Honor Society dinner a couple years ago in Pueblo. It was only the second time they've had it. And this is some of the crew uh, from Excel. Uh, you remember Keeney Martin? She came here and talked. Here's Lacey. Uh, they both came here and talked. Uh, Keeney's uh, our foundation representative. Lacey is still overseas, deployed in Afghanistan, I think, right now, or somewhere, somewhere over there. She's in the National Guard. Uh, she's in her last enlistment before she retires. Uh, this gentleman here was a, a helicopter pilot. He uh, didn't stay with Excel very long. Uh, I don't know where he went, and uh, some of the guys from the power plant down in Pueblo. This is Keeney's husband. They're both Army officers, and uh, he's tall. And uh, just some of the sponsors. XL was one of the sponsors. We got to sit with one of the Medal of Honor recipients at that dinner. Uh, I was also selected to go uh, to the USS Colorado commissioning uh, last year uh, in uh, Groton, Connecticut. Uh, was quite an honor to go to that. Uh, to be a part of that crew. Uh, one of my coworkers' son designed the logo. He um, wasn't, wasn't assigned to the Colorado at the time, but he became a crew member during the commissioning ceremony. Uh, the battle stars here represent the battle stars won by the original USS Colorado, the battleship. Those are their battle stars. And then um, the, the Terra Maricu, I'm not sure, Domita means untamed by land and sea. And so, and the horse has nothing to do with the Broncos, it's just the untamed. So, uh, and then there brings us to today. So, <laughs> I've been the treasurer here for five years, and uh, I want to thank Ed for the wannabe, but uh, 
you can see it was close. It was that close to uh, being in the, uh, in the Air Force, and I would have enjoyed either one, actually. Uh, but uh, that's my story. Yeah. Uh, I know you were on the last gunship uh, destroyer. I was on a tugboat that uh, we had, uh, we towed targets. And I got to tell you, the Navy is lousy shot. <laughs> we, we, we weren't aiming for you. <laughs> we got one five inch shell between the. Uh, Stack in the aftermath. <laughs> right on through. Yeah. And I was in the radio shack one night, and all of a sudden I heard boom, and the radio shack lit up. We had been silhouetted with star shells yeah. instead of the target. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was more real life that way. So. Kim, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Again, it's a pleasure. A <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do take donations. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good checks. And I know you have one. Of oh, those, yeah. Thank you. Add that to your collection. All right, I will. So, well, thank you very much. Please stick around. Visit with Kim some more. Yeah, John. I'd like to just comment that uh, a girl by the name of Sharon Lane. Oh, yes. Uh, Sharon Lane was a nurse in Vietnam. Uh, there are eight women on the wall, Vietnam Memorial. And 50 years ago today, Sharon was the only nurse to die of hostile fire. A mortar hit there. And, and the ironic thing is she wasn't taking care of uh, US military, she was taking care of Vietnamese. But she was the only one to die of hostile out of the eight that are in there. So just a thought. Wow. Yeah, well, thank you. 50 years ago. That is amazing. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, please stick around, visit. We some more donuts and refreshments and visit the museum upstairs <coughs> as well. More times. You have to be